This is the benefits of using native plants for game and non-game wildlife. This is the sum total of the Texas NRCS biologist cadre. It's a small group. Manuel De Leon is on the far left. He covers the Panhandle, Zone 1, Panhandle and Eastern Rolling Plains. Ryan McClintock, second from the right, covers the Edwards Plateau, Trans-Pecos. Uh, Jim Rogers, who's here, covers South Texas, Zone 3, uh, South Texas and the Coastal Prairies. We don't have a biologist right now for Zone 4. They're, they're hopefully we'll have one shortly. And I cover North Central Texas, Zone 5, Eastern Rolling Plains, Cross Timbers, and uh, Blackland Prairie. And Russell Castro, right there in the middle, in addition to being a technical wizard on computers this morning, he's our state biologist and rides herd over all of us, or he tries to. So let's look at uh, the baseline information of what we're talking about, rangeland. Half of the world's land mass and 59% of the acres of Texas are rangeland. So if we go to the definition from the Range Society, land on which the indigenous, meaning native vegetation, predominantly grasses, grass-like plants, forbs, or shrubs, managed as a natural ecosystem. There's a lot of different types of um, climatic conditions across Texas. What happens in the 8-inch rainfall belt in far west Texas is a lot different than what happens in Beaumont. So it's all rangeland, but it needs to be managed according to its capabilities. People often confuse rangeland with cattle grazing, and they are it is used for that, but cattle grazing is a... Uh, land use, but beef, but rangeland is a land type. Now the early history of Texas, prior to 1833, buffalo were, was the large grazing animal that was present. Between 1833 and 1872, the buffalo were taken out, but if you look at some of these different quotes, Ferdinand Romer was an early botanist. Um, just like the cattle in this photo on the bottom, that could be buffalo, and that's how they would have looked, just covering the prairie, thousands and thousands, 60 to 90 million buffalo in the United States. But by 1856, along the Red River, there were very few to be found, according to Mr. Parker. And here, uh, Dr. Brook, 1849, finest site I ever saw, immense meadows, two or three feet deep, of fine grass and flowers. So we've had a history of good range Man it, good range lands, but the problem we had was a lack of range management from the early days. This publication is available online as a PDF, Cattle Ranges of the Southwest by H.L. Bentley. I'd encourage you to read it if you want to know about the early days of grazing management. And in, in, in this little publication, he talks about a stockman who was moving with cattle through San Saba, Tom Green, and up to Taylor County. And I worked in Taylor County 14 years, so this was of interest to me. In the summer of 1867, he says, when that country was very sparsely settled, grass everywhere was one to three feet high. What you also have to take into account that the buffalo numbers were decreasing, the range was showing off, the grasses were really lush and growing, and they thought, man, we can run a cow to two acres, 300 cows to the section, 2.1 acres per head. That was not feasible, not doable, and after a period of time, it began to look like this. It was gray short, uniformly across all the land, and then he quotes, at the end of 30 years, almost every condition has changed. The carrying capacity of the range has steadily decreased until it is an exceptional property that can carry one head of stock to five acres. And he says, at, as recently as ten years ago, you could carry a cow to five acres. But now, it's often not considered best policy to put more than 50 cows to a section. So look at the decrease in the stocking, or the available acres, over a 30-year period. So in effect... The rangelands of Texas were overgrazed before 1900. So every generation of landowner is working with a lower condition unless they turn around their grazing management. 
Uh, someone this morning mentioned leaving the land better for their kids than they got it. That's what we need to be doing, but it's it's a long road to hoe to uh, improve your range condition unless you're knowing the stocking rate and maintaining that stocking rate at a healthy healthy rate. <coughs> so what caused the early grazing, over early overgrazing? Uh, back then there was so much grass. If you look at some of the movies, uh, that Kevin Costner movie, uh, open range. That was very similar to what they were doing. They were just traveling around, grazing whatever was available. They didn't care. They didn't have to own it. It was there. They were taking advantage of it. So those early ranchers that moved in found the water, headquartered around the water, and then just grazed thousands of acres. They, they were striking it rich. Then, about the 1870s here in Texas, or at least around Abilene, the uh, railroad came in, that brought speculators, people wanting to buy the land, make a profit on it, show that it would grow a lot. Uh, once you started having the overgrazing, it was just a snowball rolling down the hill that kept getting bigger and worse. Arrival of the nester, the cropland was, the land was plowed out and put into cropland, and that was part of what they did in this study was try to show how they could recover um, areas that had been cropped for a couple of years, put it back to grass, and survive. <clears throat> and there was an overall lack of interest in range management back then. And they had no drought planning, which in Texas and every state you need to know how to stock the land to prepare for a drought. And with the overgrazing came an increase in these native plants. They were already in Texas, but they sure have spread with a combination of overgrazing and a lack of fire, the prevention of wildfire, Native Americans set fire, uh, but the settlers wanted to stop fire, so that allowed a lot of these plants to spread. And does sort of this summary here remind you of anything that happened in the 30s leading up to and the Dust Bowl? So that was, we're, we're not learning from our mistakes. This is a, a neat little uh, summary. He went to a meeting to give a talk to a group of landowners about what they could do to Im improve their land. They weren't real impressed with it. And he said it, at least one stockman stood up and offered this resolution, adopted uh, without any uh, dissenting voices, resolved that none of us know or care to know anything about grasses, native or otherwise, outside of the fact that for the present there's lots of them, the best on record, and we're after getting the most while they last. So before 1900, we had a problem with grazing management. This is an esteemed organization, Texas Wildlife Association. That logo's been around, I guess, since it started 27 years ago. That's the end product of what people are managing for. But if you're going to manage for that, you've also got to manage for these. Because without the pollinators, we're not going to have the flowering plants, forbs, shrubs that they depend upon. What do you see in that photo? We got a preconceived notion of what that is, but when we study all the details and under, <coughs> under the light of day, we realize that's not a deer but a 10-foot tall metal sculpture out in a pasture. So we've got to open our mind to new things, the cover crop business, that's new things that are happening. And no matter what species you're wanting to manage for, you've got to also be managing for these little, the littlest wildlife you've got. Because they're the ones providing the pollination to keep the plants producing seeds, keep new plants growing, that keeps us in wildlife. This is an old quote that used to be on the back of a seed catalog from Clovis, New Mexico. Read that part in yellow. John James Ingalls was an author, orator, lawyer, a Kansas senator, quite a wordsmith, too. And in eight, he wrote this in 1872, so the reference to the cannon ruts, that's after the Civil War. That sentence in white, it yields no fruit in air or earth, and yet should its harvest fail for a single year, famine would depopulate the world. If you take that into context of when he wrote it in 1872, the railroad hadn't come to Kansas yet. You couldn't air fly food in. 
you couldn't ship almonds from California if you needed food. So that was probably a, a true statement, but scientists today say it's, it wouldn't happen. It couldn't happen. But if you remember 2011, I took that picture in Shackford County the evening of July the 20th. Outside of a uh, silverleaf nightshade right here and a couple of uh, western ragweeds back there, that could be a wintertime photo. So with, if we look, don't grow any grass in 2011 and we don't grow any in 2012, we've lost our nesting cover. We're not growing any food for the cattle, so we're going to be in a bind. And without cover for ground nesting birds, you got to ask, can you live in a world without quail? But again, this is not new. It's been around the thought about the pollination, 1901. Remove the bee from the earth, and the same stroke, you remove at least 100,000 plants that will not survive. Fast forward 115 years. The fact is, of the 100 crop species that provide 90% of the world's food, over 70 are pollinated by bees. So it's important. We've got to have them. I was sitting in the office one day at lunch reading this publication. It's available online. If you just Google Bee Basics, an introduction to our native bees, you can get that. And that quote in yellow <coughs> kind of hit me like a, a sledgehammer. What would our world be like without the beauty of flowering trees, shrubs, and wildflowers? Without the pollinators, it could happen. These two photos, when you first see this one, you think of, you look at the rack. But look at that deer. Got a small neck. See the ribs. When he gets up to leave, you can see the hip bones. Now, that may just be a deer that's hungry. That was in around San Angelo. But that could also be what happens to our wildlife if the pollinators are gone and we lose the flowering plants. So we need those native plants, but we've got to have the pollinators to help get them, get them there. And again, you've seen this. This is nothing new, but it just reinforces the importance of pollinators. Uh, this study is in the cross timbers of North Texas. Parks and Wildlife did several years ago. 76% of the food of a white-tailed deer is provided by forbs and browse and masts of the, of the shrubs, all provided by pollinators. Here's one from, I believe, the Kerr Wildlife Area, also Parks and Wildlife. White-tailed deer habits with no grazing. Notice in the spring and summer and the, even on, into the fall, they're eating quite a bit of forbs. During the winter, they have to eat more browse. But when you add heavy grazing by livestock, notice the cattle are also eating the forbs, and there's less forbs available, the deer have to eat more browse. They still they try to eat a little more grass, but they can't digest grass. They've got to have a higher nutrition, easier digested food than grass. And then in South Texas, AgriLife uh, A&M system folks put this one together. All you have to do is subtract the grass from this, and you'll see that 86 to 93% of the diet of a deer Forbes and browse. So again, it reinforces that we've got to provide the right habitat for these pollinators. We're lucky there are a lot of pollinators, a lot of different species. That little green sweat bee right there on a Texas nightshade flower, that's, that flower has got to be buzz pollinated. So he's got to come in there and flap his wings real fast, and that shakes the pollen loose. You might think, well, that's, there's just a lot of bees, but the size of those bees is also different. That's my hand in that photo on the left. That flower is tiny. And think of him. He's even tinier than that. This old big bumblebee is an inch long. So there's different size pollinators. There's different flowers that fit different pollinators. And all of these are pollinators. Bats, flies, moths, everything. But what is the bell of the ball right now is the monarch. There's federal cost share funds to improve habitat for monarch butterflies. When you improve the habitat for the monarch, you also improve the habitat for all wildlife and all pollinators. So it's a good program. If you're interested in that, visit your NRCS office. The booth for NRCS is right behind you here. We'll be glad to talk with you about it. Uh, Whole Foods, which they sell a lot of pollinator-produced vegetables and fruits, they did a uh, this this quote here is actually from USDA. Uh, bees and other species contribute an estimated $3 billion of fruits and vegetables per year, 1.6 to 8.3 billion of ag crops. So Whole Foods went in and took a photo 
that shows your produce choices with bees, and then they changed, took everything out that would be pollinated by bees, and that's what you got left. Looks like a third world country or a coastal town right before the hurricane hits. Here's your dairy choices with bees. You think bees matter? Where do we get butter from? Milk that are that comes from dairy animals that have to have a high nutritious diet. Clover, big part of a dairy animal's diet. Ice cream. Who likes bluebell? Without pollinators, we don't have any bluebell. And we'll have to go back to eating that old plastic margarine, too, because we won't have any butter. This is a new one I just found on the Internet last week. Your salad bar choices with bees and without bees. So when you see it like this, it kind of puts it in perspective that the bee is very important for our livelihood and our life as well as it is for wildlife. Now, I had this picture earlier as a black and white photo. This was taken in 2012, headwaters of the Lampasas River between uh, Hamilton and Mills County. It had been grazed by livestock, cattle, sheep, and goats for over 100 years, deer, white-tailed deer, low-fenced operation, and grazed pretty hard. But at this time, it was leased out and grazed pretty hard. The landowner enrolled it into the riparian buffer program, the CP29 Herbaceous Riparian Buffer Program, which means they have to take the cattle off the riparian area. It'll pay for fences. It'll pay for additional water if the cattle can no longer get water out of the creek. And six years later, we were back out there and took another photo. Now, if we go back and look, the purpose of this was to stabilize the creek banks. And if you look, it's been successful at that. There's little erosion happening. But do you see any Forbes in that photo? May of 2018. We should have had Forbes out there. So there will be some cases where we need to do range planting and include Forbes in the mixes. You should include Forbes in every range planting just for diversity of the plants because cattle eat the Forbes as well. What we'd like to see is a diversity of wildflowers mixed in with the grasses and the shrubs. The different plants, the different colors are attracted. They attract different pollinators. Here, um, nut all milk vetch flowers up in North Texas in February, very early in the season. Cowpen daisy grows everywhere. Cobia penstemon, big old bell-shaped flower, perfect for a bumblebee. Butterfly weed and milkweed. Bladder pod cida. Silky prairie clover. This is one that the plant material centers are looking to try to find this and have people collect seed and submit it to the plant material center in Nacogdoches. That grows on deep sands, shin oak sands. But silky prairie clover is one you need to look for if you've got that kind of sandy material. And then standing cypress. So there's different flowers that attract different butterflies and different bees and different pollinators. We need that diversity, something out there during spring, summer, and fall. Now, I'm going to give you, I'm not preaching to you, I'm just talking, but speaking to a livestock rancher and the importance of native grass production. Grass is the cheapest livestock feed you can raise. If you're feeding protein or feeding hay, that's a supplement. And you can't continue in business very long feeding hay four, five, six months out of the year. Shouldn't have to if your stocking rate is correct. You're in the grass raising business, not the livestock raising business. The way to hurt a rancher's heart is to call them a grass farmer. But that's what they are. They're a grass farmer. Their crop is grass. Instead of corn or wheat, they're raising grass. As a rancher, you should be interested in pounds of beef produced, not just the number of head that you can run. And in this case, this study, and there's lots of studies out, this is a summary. Fifteen studies on various western rangelands showed cattle diets average 75% grasses, 16% forbs, 9% browse. 25% of a cow's diet is not grass. Emory Birdwell and Deborah Clark are in the back back there. I was riding with Emory on his UTV. We come up on this stalker. He had this stalk of uh, cat claw sensitive briar in his mouth. I said, pull over and let's get a picture of that. When we stopped, he dropped it. Didn't pick it back up, but you can see it's bit off right there. Here's the flowers, so it's that long. And he was eating forbs. 
These stalkers over here are eating sedges, flat sedge. Emory sent this video to me. Let's see if I can get it to play here. I want you to be looking at that forb and tell me what what is that forb? Oh, didn't didn't work. All right, I'll tell you what happened. That that stalker was readily and lustily eating those green weeds. Can you tell what they are? Western ragweed. I wish the video would play, but we're not getting it to work. So he he stayed there and just cleaned up on these western ragweeds. So they will any. Emory said more than one stalker was eating them. They were, they were looking for them. When they're young and tender like that, pretty good protein. Now, speaking to a deer rancher, the importance of native forb and browse production. Native plants, just like for the rancher, cheapest deer feed you can raise. There's a lot of good deer feed sales people here. They've got a good supplement, but it's not what you want to feed the deer 100% of its diet. They've got to live out there on the forbs and browse that grow naturally. You're in the habitat business first and the deer raising business second. Got to maintain the habitat, take care of it. You are interested in the quality of deer. You're, you're proud of that. If you're interested in deer, you've got to be interested in the age ranges of the bucks, buck doe ratios, fawn crops, and how many deer per acre that you have, the deer density. All of that is critical to knowing how hard the habitat is getting used. And livestock grazing is okay if it's done the proper way. We want to see those cows out there. Cows and deer go together. Here's a photo in the rolling plains. Big ranch country, big deer country as well. How much food does a deer eat in a day? They eat about 3.5% of their body weight on a dry weight basis daily. This is green weight. Here's a cap for scale. But that's green weight that weighs about 8.5 pounds. When you dry that down, it will weigh 3.5 pounds. So a, a deer, a 100-pound deer, eats that much every day. 105 pounds a month, 1,300 pounds a year. That's why you should take excess does off early and not three months later in the deer season because you can save 300 pounds of deer food for the deer that remain if you take them early. Years of research, practical deer management has proven that the key factor in the production of quality deer is nutrition. If you look at that three-legged stool that deer management is based on, I think nutrition is the big leg followed by age and genetics. If you feed a deer enough, let it live long enough, it will express the genetics it has. We talk about that cow again. Most people are running bigger than a 1,000-pound cow. Used to, that was considered one animal unit, a 1,000 pounds. If you've got a 1,150-pound cow, that's 1.15 animal units. But a cow is going to eat 2.6% of its body weight, air dry, every day. So this 1,150-pound cow is going to eat 30 pounds of grasses, forbs, and browse daily. In overgrazed situations where the grass is short, they make it up on the forbs and the browse. So a cow taking in 10% in her diet of forbs and browse will eat about 3 pounds, 85% of what one deer would eat. Here's that 25% that we saw earlier. A cow taking in 25% forbs and browse will consume 7.5 pounds, equivalent to what just over two deer require. And we get like we were in 2017, and you still got cattle, they may eat up to 50% of their diet in forbs and browse, equal to just over four deer. So think about this. If your stocking rate for cattle is a cow to 20 acres, and your deer density is a deer per 20 acres, then the cows are eating more forbs and browse every day than your deer are. So to maintain a healthy range, you've got to maintain a good stocking rate on livestock and a proper deer density. You don't want to be overstocked on either one. Speaking to a quail manager on the importance of native plants. Native bunch grasses, the best nesting grass nesting cover you can get. In drought years, they will use prickly pear, they will get up under yuccas and other plants, but native bunch grasses give you the best choice. You're in the native plant managing business. If you heard Dr. Dale Rollins talk about his uh, know your plants and know how to manipulate them. 
If you're going to, doing a lot of quail work, you're going to be doing disking, patch burning, doing some in the spring, some in the fall, some in the summer. Know your plants. Know how to manage them to get the response you want. And you're interested in different cover types for these birds, nesting, brooding, screening, loafing, roosting, skate cover, all critical for the health of a good population of quail. And for quail, livestock grazing is okay if it's done the proper way. Now, this shows a, a wildfire area several years ago. We were having a field day in Throckmorton County, and we wanted to show what 250 bunch grass clumps per acre, which is considered the minimum you need, what that would look like. It's hard to show it on a big pasture that's got a lot of different sized grasses. So we took 125 foam dinner plates, took a 16-penny nail, stuck through it, stuck them to the ground about 12 feet apart, and so this is a half acre, but that's what 250 bunch grass clumps to the acre would look like, about 12 feet apart. That's the minimum you need. This, if you look at the basketball size clumps of bunch grasses, there's probably seven, 800 per acre here, even better. Harder for the predators to find the nest. You also need the other cover types, loafing cover, screening cover. Uh, need some open ground that the quail can walk through and take the chicks through. Do you think this was done for deer management or for quail management or maybe cattle management? Well, it's not even really good for cow management because there's not any shade trees left. Those two little, three little shrubs right there are not going to be enough loafing cover for quail. So you can go too far with brush management. It takes a long time for it to recover. In South Texas, it may not take but two or three years, but in North Texas, it might take 20 or 30 years to get that loafing cover and protective cover back. Speaking to a turkey manager on the value of native plants. The native bunch grasses are still the best nesting cover. Those turkeys will nest with sometimes shrubs behind them, grasses in front of them for camouflage, or sometimes they just get out in, in thick patches of grass and nest. It's a little bit hard to pin them down what they do, but you need bunch grasses. You're in the native plant managing business as well. Your specialty, though, is going to be managing a, for a diversity of hard and soft mass producing, pecans, walnuts, uh, acorns, hickories, things like that. You're interested in maintaining those large old trees, especially along riparian areas, for roost sites. And to a turkey manager, livestock grazing is okay if it's done the proper way. Parks and Wildlife has done diet studies on turkeys, grasses, browse, forbs, insects, Everything they need is what everything but the insects and the grasses are going to be provided by the pollinators. So, again, we've got to keep that in mind. Speaking to a honey producer about the value of native plants, the native flowering plants are the best pollen and nectaring plants you can grow. There's a lot of introduced plants that the bees will go to, clovers and things, but the natives are the best. You are in the plant managing business, not the honeybee managing business. A diversity of flowering plants from spring through summer and fall when the pollinators are most active is what is needed. So we've got to maintain that diversity and have a wide flowering period. And for those native pollinator plants, livestock grazing is okay if it's done proper, just like for these other species. A diversity of pollinators deserves a diversity of plants. And a diversity of wildlife deserves a diversity of pollinators. It's all tied together. You can't manage one without being a manager of all of them. So what are some of the common themes among all those different land users, those, the deer manager, the livestock manager? The need and use of native plants, either for food or food and cover. The need for diversity in plant types based on what you're managing for. The need to know your plants know, and to know how to manage them. And the need for flowering native plants during three seasons of the year. In addition to benefiting the pollinators, they're more palatable and more tender than after they go into the, the uh, seed producing stage. Overgrazing hurts all land users and especially pollinators. And I think I've said that once already. So let's look now at a few plants and a few uh, pollinators. This is from the high plains and rolling plains. Different varieties, different pollinators. You'll see overlap because we have common buckeyes everywhere, but that just shows that they're, they're widespread. They like a diversity of plants. 
This is the rather uncommon showy milkweed, only found in two or three counties in the High Plains. Here's the uh, how do you eat an elephant, one bite at a time. Think about that pollinator and the job he's got right here on that uh, agave plant. And then we've got a rather uncommon sycamore leaf snowbell, not the rarest snowbell in Texas, but uncommon. But again, pollinators making use of a different, different plants. South Texas, coastal plains, the South Texas brush country is excellent pollinator country. How much of that is flowering woody plants that you've got? A lot of it. So this is excellent for pollinators. All the different plants, the rather uncommon are almost rare, I guess, Jim, star cactus. The piney woods area, these trees, they've got some flowers on them. The little catkins and things that the pollinators will go to. And here's a, a uncommon white milkweed in East Texas. The cross timbers in Blackland Prairie. <clears throat> here's a little competition. This salt marsh caterpillar was eating the ray flowers off this Maximilian sunflower. The honeybee was getting pollen out of the disc flowers. So there's competition for those pollinating plants out there. And here is the rather uncommon but the, com the name is Common Shooting Star, but it's not very common up in our country. So as, they, as we go back to monarchs now, as, you, as they're heading south on their migration down to Mexico, they need the same things you're going to need when you go home tomorrow. They're going to need gas, and you're going to need something to drink. So a pollinator gets their gas from the nectar that are in flowering plants. And they need water out of a, tra a tank, a trough, a, a creek. Same thing we're going to need. What are roadblocks for the monarchs, though? Drought, overgrazing, late summer burns, and summer weed sprays, because they all restrict the flowering period when the monarchs are going south in October. Look at back here in August of 2011. There wasn't a lot of flowering plants available back then, except in towns in flower beds. So that's where a lot of the monarchs went through, is they had to hunt for the flowering plants in town. Now, this chart is more of a range management chart, but it, it graphs the energy use of a plant in its growth cycle through the year. So if we start the year, you also got to remember that the roots are alive. We're thinking perennial grasses predominantly now, but this will apply to other plants. But those roots of so those grasses are alive, and they're taking a little bit of energy. This white line right here, the horizontal line, is like the indicator on your car how well your battery is doing. Anything below the line is discharging the battery. Anything above the line is charging the battery. But in the plant world, this is root reserves, use of root reserves in the roots, and this is the storing of root reserves. So as we go through the winter, the roots are alive and the buds for next year's growth begin to form. So that's taking a little bit of energy out of the battery or a little bit of root reserve. As we go into spring, it kind of shifts into growth state, and we start getting growth early, and then it picks up, and we're using a lot of energy now out of those root reserves. As we start producing seed stalks, that's about the maximum use of, a, of the root reserves. The gas tank's nearly empty, or the battery is nearly drained down. So the plant has used up a lot of its energy, and if you graze hard right here all the time every year, you're going to weaken that plant. You can graze it in rotation and it works out. If we go forward now, we go into the flowering stage of the grasses, the seed production. Now, August and September, they're, they're putting energy back into the roots. They're storing energy. And about over here, the tops dry up about the time of frost. Again, there's no above-ground growth, and we've got uh, roots that are still alive, so we come back over here and start the year again. So that's what happens throughout the year. Now, if you're wondering, when's the best time for me to graze? If I just want to lease my land out for three or four months, when is the plant dormant? During the winter. So if you come in and graze off the top growth during the winter, it's not going to hurt anything. It's not going to hurt the plant. Is that the best time of year that a rancher wants to graze it? No, because it's dry and dormant. You've got a standing hay crop, but they're going to have to put 
protein and mineral out to get those cows through the winter, the rancher or the leaser would rather graze it when the plants are actively growing, April, May, June. But that's also the time when the plant energy is at its lowest, so you've got to be careful with that. And then in the fall, we want to leave some green leaves all through the year, but especially in the fall so that that plant can go into the winter in a good, healthy state. So you've got to put it to bed, so to speak. You've got to put it to rest. Now let's look at some beneficial plants. Rattlesnake Master, uh, used as a treatment for rattlesnake bite, not that it attracts rattlesnakes. Uh, this chart right here, a distribution map of the over overlay of the state of Texas shows that it's found predominantly in the eastern third of the state. But each one of these little bumps right here is a flower. So that has over a hundred flowers, which means there's a hundred receptacles of pollen and, and nectar. So a very useful plant for pollinators. Here we've got American basket flower visited by an American bumblebee, so I'm giving you the American flag there. Look at where it grows all over the state of Texas. This is an annual, reseeds itself. It's not eaten by cattle readily, not eaten by deer, so it's a perfect pollinator plant. It grows, makes a lot of flowers. Then it likes disturbance as well. This is where a large pipeline went in on the side of a road in Hill County. The next year, that came up in the winter, late winter. This is about April, full flower. This is a different location now in Coriel County, but that's when it was maturing out. Again, not grazed by cattle, but look at the seeds that are produced. Excellent for birds, ground nesting birds besides quail, but excellent quail plant. You can buy the seeds of this commercially. You can put it out. Once you get it growing, it'll be there forever. But if you want to see if you've already got it, disc through some ground in September, October, and see if it comes up the following year. You may already have that seed there. Here's purple coneflower, western half of the state. Over here in East Texas, there is a skinnier leaf version called pale purple coneflower that grows there. So there's coneflower that will be all over the uh, state of Texas. It's also known as echinacea, so you'll hear that referred to a lot in pollinator publications. You can buy seed for it. Here's compass plant, very desirable plant. This photo was taken in the evening. The sun's over here. The sun's shining through. The photo is backlit there. And the early settlers said this was a compass because the leaves would orient themselves north and south to catch the early morning sun, catch the evening sun, but to avoid the hot noonday sun. As big a leaf as that is, it would lose a lot of moisture if it was exposed to the sun. Gets six or seven feet tall. Unfortunately, where I see it up in North Texas, it's always near a county road or a highway. It's been grazed out of the pastures. Uh, if you're lucky enough that the county doesn't mow it or the highway department doesn't mow it and you can collect seed, you'll find these little rosin diamonds or pearls mixed in the seed heads. This is what the Native Americans told the early settlers that you could chew for chewing gum. And you think, well, I've got that plant, but it's white-flowered. Well, you've got white rosin weed, very similar to cousin to sylphium, but it's not the same plant as compass plant. Rock daisy, blackfoot daisy, western half of the state, blooms all summer long. It's a deer plant. They will eat it, but it's an excellent plant, excellent to put in a flower bed for landscaping with natives. This is snow on the mountain right here, and on the western half of the state is where it grows. This is snow on the prairie. It has skinny leaves compared to the rounder leaves of snow on the mountain, and the snow on the prairie is over here in east Texas. But this is an excellent pollinator plant. Deer won't eat it. Cattle won't eat it. These are the tiny flowers right here, and this is the fruit. And when those seeds mature, they split open and blow away like, a, like blue bonnets do. So it will reseed itself as well. <clears throat> I hesitate to show you a true weed, but cowpen daisy, or golden crown beards, it's often known, is a true weed. It likes to grow in sand, on abandoned land, cropland, at turn rows, edges of fields. But it blooms all summer long as long as there's moisture in the soil. Look at the different months. Now, yes, there's different years, but it blooms in May, July, October. Again, we need those plants that are blooming spring, summer, fall. So this is one that fits the bill. 
<coughs> Leavenworth Oringo. Central part of the state. There's more than one species of Oringo, several. This is just the most common one up in my area. Blooms in the hot part of summer, on up through August, sometimes into September. Excellent plant for honeybees to use, too. Maximilian sunflower, you can buy this one commercially. A lot of people say, well, I don't ever see any use on Maximilian. I was in Stephenville this, this, in, back in May, and there's nothing in this pasture but white-tailed deer and cattle, no sheep or goats, no exotics. Cattle were making use of that Maximilian. Where it's native, found native, right across the middle part of Texas, but it'll grow in a wide range of soils, commercially available, you ought to try it. The real value to a pollinator is when those flowers show up in October and November. This was taken October 6, 2016, Throckmorton County. The pollinators were working over about a quarter acre patch of native Maximilian. It was a good year in 16, a lot of rainfall, and that patch was doing well. They filled up their gas tanks. They went about 100 yards over, got on Lamb's Head Creek, and were ready to spend the night. Fly south tomorrow. Another weed, if you will, uh, but a good pollinator plant that's not eaten by cattle or deer is frostweed. Eastern two-thirds of the state, where it's native to, gets the name frostweed from the moisture in the sap that at the first frost in the fall, it will split the stems open and a ribbon of frost is exuded out. Now, it'll happen two or three times if there's still moisture in the soil, two or three more frost, but you've got to have moisture in the soil. Gay feather, this is a composite of six different species of gay feather that occur in Texas, so there's one that'll grow in your area. Uh, cattle and deer will eat this one. You can see the bite marks, but that's not a bad thing if it happens early enough because what'll happen is that, that stalk will send up new shoots. And if it happens early enough, those will each provide flowers. But this is that purple spike that you see during hunting season. Here are the monarchs on their way south in September, nectaring on gay feather. The two common types in North Texas that we have is dotted gay feather and narrow leaf gay feather. Dotted gay feather, if you dig one up, the root. Or it's, it's called a corm, C-O-R-M, will look like an onion. The narrow leaf gay feather looks like a carrot. So you can tell the difference. It's hard to tell them from the top, but you can tell the difference by the root easier. You might wonder, well, how, how can that plant be so healthy with that much root exposed? Well, it's got roots that go down to 16 feet. So even though it looks like a lot of it's exposed, there's still roots down there enough to keep it healthy. This is a one that we've been working on the last few years with the Plant Materials Center at Knox City, narrow leaf globe mallow. It's in the western half of the state. Look at the uh, color variations, uh, kind of a pinkish, a lavender, a orange. This was Crosby County. Blooms late spring through fall. Look at the uh, open flowers, the flowers fixing to open, the buds yet to open. The former uh, manager of the Plant Materials Center, Gary Ray, said when they first planted this, it came up the first year and flowered the first year. And he said he never failed when he walked by there to see some sort of pollinator on these flowers all summer long. So we're, we're looking for more collections of that from out on the land to increase the planting, uh, the testing that's going on at the Plant Materials Center, but that's going to be a good one. Here's one that's already gone through the plant materials program and has been released to seed growers to take it and grow this plant, but unfortunately no seed growers are growing it. But this one is called Cajun Sunrise Ashy Sunflower. It was developed over in from plants that grow in the northern Louisiana, northeast Texas area, released by the Plant Materials Center at, Knox, at Nacogdoches. We asked them to send us some seed. We wanted to see how far west this would grow, this particular variety. And we planted it in uh, Forney, east of Dallas, Palapeno County, Coriel County, and Hill County. These two are blackland soils. These are more uh, shallow, rocky soils. The only place that's really done well is right here in Forney. So apparently it doesn't like to go west, that variety. 
But in the red state, red stars here, that's Jack County and Wise County, I've seen it on the roadsides just as a small plant, maybe get two feet tall. But we don't have enough of it to collect and, and get a test on it. But in uh, the Plant Material Center at Nacogdoches, it's doing very well. Here's the most recent one that I'm excited about, willow leaf sunflower, another of the perennial native sunflowers, only known to grow in five counties in Texas. This is uh, Hill County, Dallas County, probably never be seen in Dallas County again. It's covered over by houses. This is uh, Cook, uh, Gainesville, and Sherman, so Bowie, Sherman, and Gainesville. Over here where this red star is is Knox County. The northern part of Knox County, up there where the red scalded clay hills are and the cedars. Charlie Shear, the district conservationist, and I were driving along. We saw this plant five feet tall in August in flower. What is that? We didn't know what it was at first. We had to figure it out. But it's, it's willow leaf sunflower. We've also found it since then in Cook County and in Wise County, and we've got 35 collections made. The plant materials folks would like to have 50 or more, so we're still looking to gather more this fall. We dropped down off that hill in Knox County, and it was growing down in the bottom land. Up there on that top, it was in a Knocko Badland complex. Uh, down here, it was in a mangum clay, so it can take the deep clays. It can take the hot, harsh clay. Uh, here's where it's growing in uh, Cook County. Right here is Cook County. It's on a Hensley loam, which is six inches of black soil over fractured limestone. You can't hardly dig one up because your sharpshooter is only going to go that deep. But it's growing there. So it's adapted to that soil type. It's adapted to this harsh clay soil. It's got, it's got promise. Here's a five-gallon bucket right here. And this is probably seven feet tall where we were clipping off those seed heads last fall. Button bush. Didn't want to forget about a flowering shrub, button willow, if you call it that. It grows over most of the state. Anywhere there's water, it likes to have its roots wet. It'll grow in standing water. Visited by a lot of different pollinators. It's a strong plant that will help support the soil in a creek bank. Also visited by deer, they will eat on it. And used by several types of pollinators. Now, Looking back, you get it? Looking back, I hope we don't ever come to a time when we don't have wildlife in Texas. If we lose the pollinators, we're going to lose the wildlife. And the fellow that summed it up the best is this sentence right here. Not a single bee has ever sent you an invoice. And that's part of the problem. Because most of what comes to us from nature is free. Because it is not invoiced, because it is not priced, because it is not traded in the markets, we tend to ignore it. And that's a true statement. That's what happens with the buffalo, the passenger pigeon, a lot of other wildlife. All of the fruits, vegetables, and field crops you see here require pollinators. Grasses are wind-pollinated. Wheat, small grain, wind-pollinated. Corn, wind-pollinated. But cotton, alfalfa, we need these pollinators. The last four or five years I've been studying the pollinators, trying to get in touch with the softer side, I guess, the pollinator side. And when you get in touch with the pollinators, they'll talk to you. And they ask me to send you a message. Words of caution, they say. Because when we go, we're taking you with us. So in summary, we've got to restore the land first. You can bring the livestock back, rest it two or three years if it's overgrazed, then reintroduce the livestock. You've got to learn your plants. Know the plants that grow on your land. Intensive management of a few head of livestock to begin with will get you going on a good direction. You can absorb uh, drought better that way if you're not fully stocked. You need to be a keen observer of small changes on the land. Photo points, taking those pictures at the same locations once or twice a year. Very important to do. And then manage for the long term. You've got to have that long, far vision to see what that land hopefully will look like. And if you're having trouble with appraisal districts wanting you to run so many animals per acre or so many acres, animals on your property that it's overgrazing, 
consider changing the wildlife valuation. You can still graze under the wildlife valuation, but they don't set a mandated uh, number of animals. And I'll end it with this photo from the panhandle. The sign just says, Home of Wildlife. But native rangelands and forests truly are the home of wildlife. So any questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Mark your calendar now for next year's Texas Wildlife Association 34th Annual Convention, coming up July 11th through 14th of 2019 in San Antonio. This is a production of Roland Recording.